exploring the rich Hispanic history in Atlantic City, and a Latino that's leading the way in healthcare. It's all here on this week's Latino Motion. Join us. Choose quality, value, distinction. Choose Stockton. Latino Motion with Bert Lopez is presented by Latino Motion Public Affairs Media, a New Jersey nonprofit corporation, and Stockton University. This edition of Latino Motion with Bert Lopez is brought to you by the HD Studios at the campus of Stockton University. Funding for Latino Motion is provided by Atlanticare, healthcare you can believe in. Atlantic City Electric, energy for a changing world, and South Jersey Gas. Welcome to Latino Motion, a weekly interview show highlighting issues impacting New Jersey's Latino community while advancing understanding of Latino cultural heritage and contributions to our society. And here is your host, Bert Lopez. Buenos dias and welcome to Latino Motion. One free resource is available in your community that is often overlooked is the Free Public Library. To talk about the Free Public Library is Heather Perez. Welcome, Heather, to Latino Motion. And you're Thank the you. activist, uh, archivist, I should say, for Atlanta City Public, uh, Free Public Library, as well as the Atlanta City Historical Museum. So first of all, let's start with that title. What is a archivist? Uh, an archivist is a person that takes care of the history of okay. an area or of a, of a place. And I have the great blessing to be able to promote and to take care of Atlantic City's history and its heritage. I, I love it. It's great. The Atlantic City has such a rich heritage and a, a fabulous history. And so I get to do things like work with the old photographs and the old books. I get to give information to people that are looking for resources to talk about the history. You know, so, some of us often overlook the library when they're looking for resources. I mean, uh, nowadays you, you do the Google and not everything's available in Google. Sure. You know, obviously, uh, the library has a wealth of information. Uh, tell me a little bit about what kind of information. And I, I think we talked about doing a research on my house. So tell me a little bit about how you would go about something like that. Well, the library itself has a lot of information and a lot of resources. We offer everything nowadays from computer use. People can come in and do those Google searches. Right. But you can also go and talk to a prof uh, professional and find out more information about how to do your information searches. But we also offer things like ESL classes and, and toy classes and things like that for kids. We offer crafts and things for the, the kids to do as well. But in my department with the history of Atlantic City, you can do all kinds of things like research Search the history of your house. You can look up and see who used to live there. You can find out information about them. You can find out when your house was built. And you can see pictures of it even if we, if we get lucky. Many of us are entrepreneurs and maybe thinking about starting a new business. And, uh, you know, we may spend some money and, and a lot of, waste a lot of time doing research. But the, the Free Public Library is a good source to get information as well. Sure. We've done things for people like uh, locate information about uh, earnings and profits, uh, historical information. People have looked up to see like what kinds of businesses have, have been in, in the city before to see if their business might prosper. Now let's talk about the Latino communities. I think uh, particularly the Atlanta City uh, Library offers material in Spanish and uh, certainly you mentioned the ESL classes and I think a lot of the surrounding libraries uh, have done uh, a lot of outreach to the Latino community. Tell me a little bit about the special project that you're undertaking um, right now at Atlanta City Library. Sure, it's been really interesting. You know, the, the community in Atlantic City is changing so much. There's a lot of immigration into the community. There's a lot of folks that uh, may not speak English as their first language. So we do offer a lot of books and resources in multiple languages at the library. Well, the project that I'm working on right now is really interesting and it's, it's very dear to my heart. I've been working on it for more than a year. And it's a whole exhibit about the history of the Hispanic community in Atlantic City, you know, going from basically from the early teens, 1910s, all the way up to the present day, talking about the changes in the community and, and the different waves of immigration into the community, but also the culture and trying to keep their, their home country culture alive. Uh, of course, I was surprised when I got a call from you to, to, to do an interview uh, about the Hispanic Alliance and some of the activities that have taken uh, place in Atlanta City. And you've done that kind of research uh, with many residents uh, 
Some that have been there for a long, uh, short time and some that have been there for a very long time. We have been. Since May, we've been doing interviews with members of the community. And what we've been trying to do is record some of that history. Because as we've found out, there's not much written. It's mm -hmm. recent history. And a lot of times, people, as they're living it, they don't think to record it. So it's been really interesting to discover you know, who the first publishers of the Latino newspapers are or who those first uh, councilmen were. It's been a really interesting process. And it's been a lot of fun uh, to, to record that history so that in the future, 50 years from now, that history will be recorded and people will be able to go back and do that research that they need to to record more history. And obviously you, you said it's a passion. Uh, you, you also speak Spanish and your husband is uh, from Nicaragua. He's from Guatemala. Oh, Guatemala. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you, you have the passion. Uh, uh, certainly within the Latino community, you're able to communicate effectively with the Latino community. Sure, Tell we've me, been able to do some of the interviews in Spanish, you know, and, and if people, you know, would like to come in and interview with us or they have recommendations for interviews, we'd love to have them on also. Well, let, let's talk about that. Uh, we do have information that we want to put up on, on the screen uh, regarding how they could uh, do that and also talk about the event that's taking place uh, on uh, the 10th, uh, October the 10th. Tell me a little, a little bit about that event. On October 10th, we'll be formally opening our exhibit, and we're very excited to be able to do that, to show to the public and, and to show to, to all of our, our friends and family to be able to show that exhibit. This exhibit is going to be one of a kind. It's never been done before in Atlantic City. It's all about the Hispanic heritage of Atlantic City, all about the history and all about the culture. And I think it's going to be really interesting and educational as well as really fun. Uh, on the 10th, we'll be having our formal opening. It'll run from about noon to 4 o'clock that day. We'll have two classes that are going to be offered, and everything will be done bilingually, uh, you know, Spanish and English. And then we'll also have a formal ribbon cutting to actually open the exhibit. Yeah, just running through uh, the schedule here, 12 o'clock is the Hispanic Family History presentation. Uh, 1 p.m. is the welcome and ribbon cutting, and then from 2 p.m. Uh, it's Atlanta City Rumba presentation. Uh, what does that entail? A little bit of dancing, or well, it's 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 a history actually. It's all about the connections with, between Cuba and Atlantic City, and there are quite a few. It's really interesting to note. Uh, Vicky Goldlevy, who is a, an Atlantic City historian and a very dear friend of mine, will be doing that presentation. She's a renowned speaker and author. She's written a book called Cuba Style, all about graphics. And she's going to be uh, actually opening an exhibit in, next year in Miami of her Cuba collection. And so we're really lucky to have her come and present that day. It's, the title is based on a song that was written in 1950 by Pedro Albani called The Atlantic City Roomba. Mm -hmm. And it's a really fun song. And, and you'll get to hear that. And uh, maybe you'll want to dance along, too, because it really is catchy. Well, you know, at 3 o'clock, you will have some entertainment uh, uh, as well. And I know there's, there's been a, uh, a, a lot of history in, in Atlantic City with Latino community. Uh, that have uh, many have migrated there because of the jobs and opportunities that were available at the time when the hospitality market had opened up. And at some point, even uh, Picky Kravis was involved with uh, an exchange baseball team. Uh, a basketball team, a basketball, sure. And it was a basketball it team. It was, okay. yeah. And you'll be able to see a picture of that, too. We have a picture from the 1960s. And that was from Puerto Rico and, and, and Atlanta City. Exactly, yeah. It's a, it was, ran for 39 years. It was a fabulous program. Uh, and I do recall that the, the inlet part of Atlanta City was like Little San Juan. We had a large Latino community uh, there for, for many, many years. And it's still uh, is very diverse Latino community nowadays. And certainly it's spread out throughout the, the city now. Certainly, and that's what we've discovered also. So we want to put up the, the information once again as to where uh, people could submit uh, or, or ask to submit an interview or additional information. You're also collecting autofacts as well. So sure, someone yeah. has pictures. Mm -hmm or pictures and that kind of stuff, they should contact you as well. Yes, please, yes. And they don't have to donate them if they want to just lend them for the length of the exhibit. The exhibit will be running from now until December. And we are so grateful because the uh, New Jersey Historical Commission has given us a grant to be able to do this exhibit. So we're very thankful for that. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Latino Motion. I look forward to uh, participating on uh, October the 10th at your, your ribbon cutting. Thank you so much, Bert. I appreciate it. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Latino Motion. Latino Motion with Bert Lopez is presented by Latino Motion Public Affairs Media, a New Jersey nonprofit corporation. Join us online at www.latinomotion.tv. Find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. We encourage your comments and contributions for show topics. Welcome back to Latino Motion. We want to go back to a previous interview that I had with Dr. Ricardo Perez. He is the chief of medicine for Kennedy Health Systems. 
and want to listen in to the information he provided and learn a little bit about this remarkable doctor right here in our area. Let's listen in. Welcome back to Latino in Motion. My next guest is Dr. Ricardo Perez, and he is the Chief of Medicine with Kennedy Health Systems. Welcome, Dr. Perez. Thanks for having us, Bert, or me, actually. <laughs> uh, 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 it, it's, it's great to have you. I heard a, a lot about you, and as a Latino who's in charge of uh, the Chief of Medicine, uh, it's, it's a great honor uh, to have you here in, in our um, uh, backyard, if you will. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where it is that you work and uh, what does it mean to be Chief of Medicine? Uh, I work for the uh, Kennedy Healthcare System. Uh, we're located in South Jersey in three campuses, uh, Cherry Hill, uh, Stratford and Washington Township. Uh, as far as uh, being chief of medicine, I was actually, I've been in the system for about seven years now, going on my eighth year. Uh, I was uh, always a physician on the medical staff there. And uh, the last, uh, about two years prior, I joined on and became employed by the healthcare system as their medical director for their inpatient hospitalist group. So we basically are internal medicine trained physicians working in the hospital, taking care of hospital patients, and that was our main focus. Uh, so the group was uh, originally when I started, we started out with four of us. Uh, currently we have uh, up to 16. We have 12 physicians, three nurse practitioners, and a per diem physician that we hired thus far in two years. Uh, after doing all that work with recruiting, uh, I was actually appointed and asked to become the chief of medicine for the healthcare system, uh, which of course I uh, took the position, I was deeply honored. Uh, as Chief of Medicine, uh, we're responsible for uh, patient safety, uh, quality metrics, uh, physician disciplinary problems. Uh, I'm not in charge of the surgical staff, but the medical, the uh, physicians on the medical staff side and the, subs and the medical subspecialties, uh, I, they're under my purview and under my auspices. So uh, we do a lot of uh, peer review. We, mm -hmm. we look at case-by-case uh, case case, uh, reviews on uh, certain things that we could have done different. Uh, we speak with physicians on the medical staff on how they can get better quality and how they can better take care of their patients. Uh, so it's been, uh, I'm only in my second month doing it, so uh, wow. it's definitely been a challenge, but I'm welcome to it. Well, let's, let's uh, follow how you got here. And uh, obviously you have some interesting uh, roots. You're Dominican. Tell us about your, your family history, how you ended up uh, here in the United States. Uh, well, I was, uh, both my parents were born in the Dominican Republic. Uh, they came, uh, my father's family immigrated to Brooklyn when he was around 10 years old. Uh, my mother's family ended up immigrating in, in uh, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, up in central Jersey, oh, yeah. when she was about 14. Right. Uh, very large families. My, my father's one out of eight children. My, my mother's one out of seven children. And you're from Santiago. Uh, Santiago, La República Dominicana. So uh, that's, where, uh, that's where my roots are, you know, essentially. Right. Uh, although I was born in Brooklyn, I'm first generation in this country. Uh, after, after living in Brooklyn for about six months, my mother didn't like the congestion there, right. so we ended up moving to the Jersey side, so to speak. And I uh, was pretty much raised and grew up in Perth Amboy, uh, went to Perth Amboy High School. Uh, went to uh, which has a Latina mayor right now uh, correct she, she was here on the show a few months back yeah definitely uh, she's I think she was the first one first uh, Latina yeah. mayor in uh, Jersey history I believe yeah uh, and uh, Perth Amboy uh, is an Hispanic enclave uh, you know I would venture to say probably about 80 to 85 percent of the town is Hispanic you know whether it be Puerto Rican Dominican Mexican mm -hmm. uh, Guatemalan Colombian what have you uh, so it was definitely um, Definitely felt at home, you know. It's uh, growing up there was a good experience. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit how you got the interest to go to medical school, and uh, not only that, I understand you have a dual degree, so you're also an attorney as well as a as a doctor. So you know, when when mom and dad are they want you to become a doctor, they want you to become a lawyer. You decide to become both. <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it's funny because uh, you know, I, my career path and my education has been kind of like a very windy road, so to speak. Okay. I knew I wanted to go to college, right. uh, so. Uh, let, let me just stop yeah. you there. What made you uh, get that in your mind that you wanted to go to college? Um, my parents uh, were both high school dropouts, so they okay. weren't formally educated. Right. But they're probably the hardest working people I know in my entire life. And uh, from early on, they stressed to all of us the importance of an education, especially in this country. Right. So growing up in the rural portions of the Dominican Republic, not really having uh, you know a lot of formal education, coming to this country and the only mentality was work, work, work. You know, whenever you can. Uh, I don't think I think they realized later on in life that you know what, you know, in order to succeed, 
you definitely, you know, an education helps, and uh, right. they really, you know, push that upon us uh, at a young age. So you decided to go to school. Um, you knew you wanted to go to college. Didn't, wasn't sure which way to go, and you decided to go to law school and medical school. I, when I was, uh, and, and that's a, that's the thing. When I was in uh, college, my I believe it or not, I was an engineering major. Oh. So I started as an engineering major, and then after the first month, I realized I was very good at math, but I couldn't build anything. Okay. <laughs> so then I ended up, uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to commit completely to medical school, and I was a nursing major, believe it or not, and wanted to do nurses anesthesiology. Wow. You know, that was my game plan back then. And uh, after about a year, I had a mentor that was a physician. She taught our anatomy course, and she goes, you're a smart guy. Why don't you just do the whole thing? Right. And I was like, really? Um, you know, and then... Following, uh, you know, that following semester, I became a biology major. I got my minor in chemistry and Spanish. I enrolled in medical school and got in. I started uh, August of 1998. Uh, and uh, medical school uh, uh, was definitely a trying time. It's uh, a lot of work, uh, a lot of intensity. And that second year of medical school is when, you know, because I didn't go into it thinking that I wanted to get a law degree. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, I got involved in the student government and, uh, and afterwards, I was nominated to uh, a position as a student member on a federal advisory board in Washington, D.C. Oh. So it was uh, very eye-opening for me. Um, I was very engaged in it. And it's something that I never knew I liked until that moment in time. Oh. You know, So I was about 25 years old at that it's time. It's getting, getting the exposure, which is very important when we tell kids to get involved in different things, to get that exposure. Um, we miss a step here because sure. uh, before you went, to college, you had to stop in the military. Yeah, well, I actually did that while I was in medical school. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, I was part of the uh, Army, uh, uh, New Jersey Guard, the Army uh, portion okay. of it. Uh, so the Army National Guard actually helped pay for a lot of my tuition, uh, both in medical school and in law school. Uh, and that's a good option because uh, a lot of the struggles with uh, la Latinos is having to pay for uh, college. Uh, there are some. Uh, uh, money's available, and certainly if you uh, look for those, like serving in the reserve, it's a good opportunity to get that education. I think it's an excellent opportunity. And tell you the truth, uh, you know, uh, I'm not currently uh, enlisted now, but when I was there, it was, uh, it was a matter of pride mm -hmm. to wear the uniform and actually serve, you know, uh, perform a service for your country. Uh, we were part of a medical support uh, uh, group, and, uh, you know, we supported a, a ton of soldiers, you know, whether tankers, infantry, or what have you. And it was definitely an eye-opening experience, and it's amazing uh, the, the quality of, and, and character of the people that serve in the military nowadays, and uh, it's a testament to them. I, I, I felt privileged and honored to be working alongside them. Well, you certainly had a, uh, quite a career, uh, for starting off uh, going, to, going to college, trying to decide what you wanted to do, and ultimately what made you stay with medicine as opposed to law? Um, I actually uh, enrolled in a dual degree program when oh. I was in medical school. So we you know, ordinarily take about seven years to complete both. Right. Uh, this program allows you to do it in six years. So, uh, uh, in, and the reason why I did is because I wasn't sure if I wanted my entire career to be clinical. And there was a, an aspect of the law that I never knew I liked. Now, if you get my practice, you could defend yourself too. That too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the running joke for like everybody. Well, we're going to continue this discussion. Very interesting. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Latino Motion. La Cumbre de Liderazgo Hispano de Nueva Jersey les invita a su quinto aniversario donde habrá más de ocho talleres educativos, presentaciones culturales y mesas de exhibiciones para el crecimiento de los hispanos en la región. Todos los años entregan becas a estudiantes y reconocen los líderes de la comunidad. Comienza a las 8 de la mañana y cierra con broche de oro con una gran gala. Para escribirte visita la página web en pantalla. Los esperamos el 24 de octubre en la Universidad de Rome and Glasgow, New Jersey. Welcome back to Latino Motion. We're continuing our discussion with Dr. Ricardo Perez uh, with the Kennedy Health Systems. And uh, before we continue our discussion, we wanted to uh, give you a few announcements. First is that we do have the Hispanic Leadership Summit that's taking place at Rowan University. I uh, want you to make note of this. This is taking place September the 20th at Rowan University. It's an all-day event with uh, a lot of nice workshops, including health disparities, is going to be one of the workshops. It's from 8.30 to 4 p.m. 
Uh, there's also a gala from 6.30 uh, to 11.30 at Rowan University. The website is up on the screen, www.hispanicleadershipnj.com for more information. I hope you could join me there at that very nice event. Uh, going on to the next announcement, we do have a couple of cultural celebrations that are taking place. Um, the Puerto Rican Festival Celebration of Hamilton is taking place on August the 24th, the 29th, the 30th, and the 31st. The uh, 24th, I believe, is the flying racing, and then the festivities uh, throughout those other dates is taking place at the Puerto Rican Civic Club in Hamilton at 367 Old Folks Road in Hamilton. The phone number is 609-704-2526. Hope you can make note of that. And also the Latin F Music Festival. And this is taking place in Pleasantville. It's August the 24th. This is uh, replacing the Puerto Rican Parade, essentially, that used to take place in Atlanta City. This year it's going to be in Pleasantville at the West Park Avenue, which is the Max Manning Park. There, there is a website, uh, www.AtlanticCityParade.com. There's also the phone number, which is 609-226. 8183. Hope you could participate in those facilities. Certainly uh, a lot of nice cultural events that are taking place and uh, I was mentioning the uh, summit that's taking place on the 20th. Uh, one of the, the important workshops is on health disparities. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about your career path. Very interesting. Uh, you were uncertain of what to take so you took both uh, a law degree and a medical mm -hmm. degree which is great. Uh, I just wanted to ask you to what a, to, to tell our audience, particularly the young, the youth, who are undecided as to career paths like you were and as I was uh, during that age, what advice do you give them about uh, their, their, what they should consider making a decision? I think, uh, you know, if you're not sure what you're doing, I, I think the best thing to do is explore. I mean, okay. uh, I went into, uh, you know, undergraduate institution over, you know, in college, and I wasn't exactly sure where my career path is gonna, was going to lead, and then you find yourself, you know, as long as you're in the mix, you will be in the mix, so to speak, right? So opportunities usually present themselves in, in very weird capacities. Uh, you know, I went from, my career took me from medicine to law to, uh, you know, academics, where I worked at, at University of Medicine District in New Jersey. I was a program director for an internal medicine residency where I was in charge of 52 residents. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I flipped over and I was corporate you know, working for a hospital system, creating a, a physician uh, medical group, and uh, now currently doing an administrative role. But if you asked me five years ago, or seven years ago, or 10 years ago, where I was gonna be, I would have no idea about it. So my, my advice would be, continue pursuing your educational you know, goals. I mean, uh, eventually it's gonna come to you. It's gonna come to you. And the second piece of advice is that, uh, don't let fear stop you from pursuing anything. You know, uh, a, a, a wise person that, I, you know, one of my mentors told me that there's usually two, that whenever you have choices, there's two elements you gotta contend with, time and pressure. So if you have a choice you gotta make, how much time is it gonna take to get to that goal and how much pressure do you have to apply? And when you make that choice, understand that that's a sacrifice you have to make. And that was one of the solid, most solid pieces of advice I've ever had. Now you mentioned mentor, so obviously you had mentors along the way. What advice do you give in terms of making sure that you find those mentors along the way? Um, usually, uh, for me, it's been academics, ac academic people, uh, especially earlier on in my career. Uh, so the the dean of my uh, the dean of admissions at my medical school was a mentor for a bit. Uh, uh, a couple of my professors, uh, some clinicians. Uh, my mentor for the uh, law program when I enrolled in law school, uh, uh, he was uh, very instrumental, at least early on in my career. And then you meet people along the way. You know, uh, I, I've met, uh, you, you're a chairperson over Atlanta Care. I, I've, met, uh, I've met board members at different hospital systems that were very friendly. And we're not competitors, obviously, because I work for Kennedy, but we share a lot of ideas. So mentors are everywhere. Uh, you'll never know where you're going to find them. but. Find those individuals that are in your career track that you're interested in, and they can guide you along the way. I mean, their their advice is priceless. Priceless. And, and being open to receiving the advice of a mentor is so critical for the youth. Sometimes it, it's harder to accept and to look for those mentors, but certainly being open-minded about it, I think, yeah. is important. I mean, uh, it's funny because you know, the the older you get, the the more you realize, the less you know, right? It's right. Uh, you know. 
the youth don't have all the answers, although we, although we think, you know, at that time that we do. And uh, the mentors really you know, put everything in perspective, I think. Let's talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, the changes that are taking place in the medical field, obviously, that you deal with it on an everyday basis. Uh, one of the, the most important things is uh, making sure that the quality is there, which is now part of your job. How critical is it to make sure that quality health care is being provided? Um, a lot of us uh, on our senior leadership team over at uh, Kennedy Healthcare Center uh, are the mantra that imagine if this is your family member, right? right? So your family member, your loved one, your spouse, uh, those individuals, you want them to have the highest quality care that they can possibly receive. And uh, I think, you know, as part of the profession, that's what we have to deliver. So, uh, you know, using, uh, using that vehicle, I actually, uh, you know, I, I express that to our medical staff members. I think we do a, a very good job at achieving that. I think when you, when you really have that quality, uh, it really drives everything, especially when it, in, in uh, regards to patient safety. That's a big mantra of our institution. So patient safety, patient quality, it's, gonna, it's always going to equal good care. Always yeah. going to equal good care. Hope you join me on October the 24th because Dr. Galdo Perez is going to be part of a panel uh, doing the health disparities at the Hispanic Summit that is taking place on October the 24th for Vaughan University. Thanks for joining us and thank you, Heather, for joining us here on sure, Latino thank Motion. You. Choose quality, value, distinction. Choose Stockton. Funding for Latino Motion is provided by Atlanticare, healthcare you can believe in. Atlantic City Electric, energy for a changing world. And South Jersey Gas.